So just for intros, I'm uh, the co-founder and chief scientist at Number Station. Uh, prior to Number Station, I was doing my PhD at Stanford with uh, Chris Ray, working on representation learning and more specifically focusing on structured data and knowledge graphs. Uh, and I actually overlapped uh, with some of the Snorkel founding team at uh, Stanford. So I'm super excited for this uh, joint webinar today. And thanks for having me. My name is Shane. Uh, I am a former Java developer and architect is how I started my career uh, back in the days at Red Hat. Uh, and then I kind of pivoted uh, into more of the intersection between product and marketing for a number of database companies, particularly in the NoSQL space and distributed database space, which you know naturally evolved into AI, which is why I'm here today. I'm excited to share with you a little bit more information on today's topic of how do we put together you know, both unstructured and structured together in our RAG pipelines. Little note in the agenda, I'm gonna start with a little bit of context. Uh, so for those of you that are knee deep in enterprise AI, just bear with me. Um, I just have a, a few slides to talk about kind of some high level um, trends that I'm seeing. Um, kind of the core tenets of AI data development, right? And how that relates to enterprise AI. And then we'll get into kind of this notion of unstructured and structured data, right? What are those? pipelines look like. Uh, agentic RAG, uh, which is something that I think is still a little bit early in terms of adoption, uh, but I think is really, really powerful. And I'm excited to have Ina's here uh, from Number Station because they're certainly at the forefront of that. And she's going to have a whole lot more to say about it than I do. The more I talk with data scientists, uh, kind of line of business you know, executives, what a lot of enterprises have in common is that in a sense, SMBs have become a bottleneck. Um, these are the folks that have the most, you know, internal business or industry knowledge, right? Expertise. Uh, but a lot of what they do requires manual effort. And because these folks are far and few in between, you know, and very skilled, uh, you kind of run out of bandwidth, right? There's only so many documents they can review, uh, so much information they can scour for and put together. Uh, they require training. They often have years or even decades of experience. So if you're trying to increase productivity, you're trying to scale your business, uh, one of the places people are looking at now is AI, right? And I see kind of two examples taking place here. One of them, I would say, is AI co-pilots, right? This isn't too different from, uh, say, GitHub co-pilot and the effect it has on developers. Uh, this is the same thing in terms of SMEs. So I made a little example here, uh, but let's just pretend we have an SMB, maybe at a call center, uh, that person can handle five requests an hour, right? I guess that seems low for an example, but let's roll with it. Uh, if they had a co-pilot available to them, maybe they can handle 20 requests an hour, right? It's going to help them save time, be more efficient. The other path is an AI assistant, which kind of becomes your frontline SME. Right? So the ability to offload requests that typically would have gone to a person, the AI assistant can now handle directly. Um, so in my little example here, if we were to improve you know, SMB productivity from five requests an hour to 20, uh, and then we introduce an AI assistant that is able to offload you know, an additional 10 requests an hour, we can go from handling five to handling 30. Um, so it's kind of a little bit contrived and made up here. Uh, but that is, in a sense, you know, how I'm seeing it. Uh, when I talk to folks at conferences and elsewhere, uh, pilots and assistants tend to be kind of the first step, you know, to using generative AI uh, to kind of help improve productivity. The challenge uh, that we'll start to get into here is we obviously want, you know, employees or customers now interacting with these co-pilots and assistants. But how do we transfer all that domain knowledge, right? All that information, whether it's in PDFs or it's in relational databases, how can we make that you know, a part of that AI co-pilot assistant so that it can provide us high quality, um, accurate responses? And that's where AI data development comes in, right? So we kind of come back to this. We know that you know, our AI co-pilot is going to be more effective, right? The answers are going to be more accurate, more complete, um, of higher quality, the more we can transfer that knowledge into it. But if you think about it, what's really behind those AI assistants and co-pilots are one or more AI or ML models, right? Most often um, the examples here, classification and information extraction in terms of predictive models, 
And then you have retrieval, generation, and evaluation in terms of generative models, right? These are kind of the backbone of your AI assistant or co-pilot. So the question is, how can we transfer this knowledge into these models? And so one way to look at it, I'll focus on the Gen AI uh, component here, is each of these approaches has core components, you know, models or features, which can be improved with training. And to be honest, the most common examples in the middle there, right? For retrieval, it's prompt chunk pairs, right? You're trying to improve the embedding model a little bit so it returns more accurate context for the LLM. Um, in terms of actually fine tuning and aligning the LLM, typically labeled prompt response pairs, right? You have um, say questions and answers, and we're trying to determine which ones are good, which ones are bad. Uh, maybe they're scored from one to five. And then finally, one that tends to not receive as much attention as we think it should is evaluation, right? At the end of the day, whether you've stood up an out-of-the-box RAG pipeline um, or you've started that process of fine-tuning the embedding model and maybe even the LLM2, you now have to evaluate the results. How well is it performing? Um, not in a academic sense, but in a enterprise sense. Do these responses meet our corporate policies, ethical standards, um, industry or government regulations? Are they the right tone that mirrors how our uh, customer service reps, for example, would answer the questions? Um, so really important to get that right. But all three of these really depend on curated and labeled training data, right? So you might start with a very large set of training data, and then you we're going to label that training data through a handful of methods, which I'll touch on here. And then from that, we'll curate a smaller set of higher quality training data, which we can use in all three of these stages. For Starperflow, if you're not familiar with it, I don't have the time to go into the details with today's particular webinar, but I think this sums it up nicely. Uh, the core of it is the concept of labeling functions. And the idea is that instead of having an SME go through, you know, a data set of, say, 5,000 prop response pairs, right? It's going to take a team of SMEs uh, months, right? Maybe more than a year, uh, depending on how big that data set is. What we want to do is collaborate with this SMEs, SMEs and find out what is the logic they use to determine whether a response from an LLM is good or bad, right? Once we understand that logic, we can encapsulate it in these labeling functions. And now instead of labeling, you know, items in your data set one at a time, we will use that logic encapsulated in those labeling functions to label all of your trading data at once. Uh, and that's where we get the really big boost in time savings. What would have taken months now takes hours, uh, maybe days, depending on how large your data set is. Um, not only that, you tend to end up with higher quality training data because we're able to remove some of the subjectivity and bias by using these labeling functions. And so if we kind of circle back around again uh, to the original context we set up, you know, we're trying to build AI assistants and COVIDs. That's really what Snorkel Flow exists for, right? Through collaboration with SMEs, uh, programmatic data development, which is how we're able to accurately label, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of data points, um, and then evaluating, you know, the results, um, kind of doing an error analysis, and we start that loop again, right? It's a very iterative loop. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, I'd say it's exceedingly rare that you label your data once, and you now have trading data that yields a, a production quality model. Uh, in practice, it's an iterative of cycle, right? We capture that domain knowledge from SMEs. We use that to create labeling functions. We curate, you know, kind of label our trading data. Then we analyze the results. We look for errors, we find them, we work with the SMEs to address them and to resolve them, you know, run those labeling functions again. And this process kind of continues at a loop until we've reached a point where our model uh, meets your accuracy requirements, whether it's 90%, 95%, you know, 99%. Uh, we keep on improving until we get there. And in terms of what we're seeing in the real world, uh, we kind of have three examples uh, of historical customers in these three particular segments. And you can kind of see for yourself 
uh, how big of an improvement it was. Um, to be fair, the improvement depends on your use case, right? If you're working on something that is fairly simplistic and doesn't require a lot of domain expertise, then something out of the box might already be in the you know, 70, 80, 90% accuracy range. Uh, and then optimization might bring you an additional five or 10%. But if you're working on something that's very specialized, right, very unique to your business, uh, very important or critical, you would see what's on the left there, right? Your out of the box model is only 25% accurate because it just doesn't have the domain knowledge and information, you know, related to your business. Um, after incorporating that, now we're at 95% accuracy and we have something we can put in production and that the business can rely on. That being said, I want to get into what I thought was really kind of a fascinating question is when I do look at RAG pipelines in particular, I find that you know, you're either on the side of doing unstructured data, you know, PDFs and, and documents and presentations, or you're on the text to SQL side, right? And you're providing a very easy way for um, anyone in your business to use natural, natural language to interact with a database. Uh, but I think there's even more value in both. And my simple example here, which you may have encountered, uh, you have health insurance and you still receive a bill, right? And I'm that person, my first instinct is why am I receiving a bill um, even though I have health insurance? If we were you know, simply querying a database and structured data, we might get a list of line items back, right? So that the purchase and those bills, you know, I'm sure they're put into um, a database, but I don't necessarily understand why I've been charged. I understand the services that I've had, but I don't understand why, given that I'm paying for health insurance, am I receiving these particular charges? On the other hand, if it was simply unstructured data, I might get a better understanding of what's in my plan and the coverage and kind of the rules, but I don't understand how those are related to my particular charges. But in a perfect world, if we had access to both, you know, that structured and structured data, now we could have very good answers uh, that correlate those together, right? You had a copay for visiting this particular doctor. You had this particular, you know, diagnostic, which you had to pay co-insurance for, right? We can kind of make up these, but I'm getting a better understanding of why I've been charged. So as I said, you know, we're typically kind of in this notion of one or the other, right? So if the document base, which you'd see a lot, is you have a prompt. Uh, it goes all the way to a retriever. Um, it's going to kind of use an embedding of that prompt to find relevant information in your vector database, pass that along to the LLM to generate a response. Um, on the other side, you know, when I look at kind of very you know, early text to SQL solutions, uh, we have a prompt uh, and then it kind of goes to the retriever. But what it's really doing is asking the underlying LLM, can you please generate a SQL query from this prompt? Right, and then we'll run that SQL query against the database and return the results. Uh, so more often than not, in my experience, I've seen kind of implementations ending up on one side of the other. And that brings us to agentic REC, uh, which I think is really fascinating and something that I hope we'll be talking a lot more of in the future here. I'm just gonna run through a few examples. Um, there's actually many patterns, so please don't think of this as an exhausted list. Uh, but one interesting one is with routing. And this is actually something that Snorkel has been working on with some of our partners uh, through the use of specialized models where you might have two different RAG pipelines um, that are very specialized for a specific task. Maybe one pipeline is to help customers who are asking about their plans, right, and their coverage. You might have a separate uh, pipeline that's specialized for dealing with billing questions. Uh, but if you think about the example I just went through, uh, maybe I, I didn't ask for the why part. I just said, hey, what what are the, you know, what services, you know, resulted in charges uh, that were sent to me? That router can kind of use an LLM and say, okay, based on this prompt, which one of these RAG pipelines is best suited to answering it? Um, so it might route it to a billing one, or if I just wanted to know is a certain service coverage covered, uh, it might route it to the plan one. Um, and then it receives that response, and of course, it passes it along. The other option, which is probably a little bit closer to uh, my example a little bit earlier, uh, is synthesis, where we might choose to forward that prompt to both pipelines. 
Uh, so please get my plan information, please get my billing information, uh, and then kind of synthesize both of those results and give me a summary as part of my response um, to help you better understand things. The other option uh, is involving more than just you know, a database, whether it's a vector database or a relational database, but potentially even other tools. Um, so we might have a prompt that kind of goes to Retriever, so it looks a little bit like a standard RAG pipeline, uh, but then that context that's received goes to an additional you know, agent, let's say a tool selector, uh, that might check with an LM and say, is there additional information, you know, uh, you know additional tools um, that I should use to augment you know, this context? Uh, and so the question I had previously, um, if I say yes, you know, we've retrieved, you know, the charges for this particular customer, we now need to retrieve the plan information as well. Um, so we're kind of augmenting that context. Those tools could be anything, right? It could go fetch information from Salesforce, fetch information from a knowledge base, um, any other kind of APIs that are available to you, uh, kind of combine that context and then pass it on to an LLM for generation. And then finally, the notion that agents can essentially you know, have you know, multiple agents available to them. So you think about it from an orchestration perspective, maybe we are creating um, kind of dynamic workflows, right? So we kind of use an LLM to help us kind of build you know, a workflow, right? A multitask operation, uh, which each step in that workflow may ultimately be another agent, right? And that agent may itself have a workflow or perform a set of tasks. Um, so it can kind of become very sophisticated, right, and, and specialized for the particular, you know, problem that you're trying to solve. So that was a little bit about uh, kind of our perspective on enterprise AI data development, um, RAG, and, and now Agentic RAG. And with that said, I'd like to turn it over to Inez, um, who can kind of take that forward and tell us how they're working with it and what they're building. Hi everyone, I'm the co-founder and chief scientist of Number Station. Um, prior to Number Station, I was doing a PhD at Stanford with Chris Ray and some of the Snorkel folks, actually. Uh, and today I'll talk about uh, Number Station, the problem we're solving, the solution we're offering. I'll do a technical deep dive into the Number Station tech, covering things like LLM agents and RAG. And I'll give you uh, a live demo at the very end of some of the agents that we built. Okay, so the problem we're solving at Number Station is essentially analytics. So in the past decade, we've seen many enterprises invest in setting up a modern data stack. Uh, and while this is great on many aspects like ETL pipelines, uh, improving storage and compute, it has also caused a lot of issues, especially for data analytics teams. And the reason is there's a lot of complexity in the tools and resources that, uh, that these teams use. And so ultimately they're overwhelmed with tickets from uh, end business users or even like business analysts uh, that try to consume this data. And so they ask things like, where can I find this dashboard? Uh, how was this field created in a database? Can you help me write this query? And, and many more requests like this. And so ultimately these data teams spend most of their time actually in support functions of these end users uh, instead of investing in longer term uh, data projects that can truly impact the business. So with the recent development of LLMs, uh, this problem is actually getting even worse. Everyone has seen all these amazing demos of LLMs writing code and SQL. And so the expectations from end users and leadership have risen to the next level. But in reality, uh, we've seen many of, uh, of these demos fail when it comes to production. And this is adding even more pressure uh, on these data teams. So just for number station overview, at a high level, we've spent a lot of work uh, in the past decade on solving problems at the intersection of data and especially structured data and LLMs, both in the Stanford AI lab, where a lot of our team comes from and enterprises like Elation and Totspot. Uh, and so we're developing a platform to help relieve the pressure that I was mentioning on these data teams and really bring the, the AI experience that people expect. And so one example customer is Vouch, an insure tech company that grew really quickly uh, recently and their data teams were just getting overwhelmed with ad hoc requests from business users. And so we helped them self-serve a lot of the, these requests and I'll, I'll walk through an example in, in, this, in this talk. 
Okay, so to give you a quick overview of how this looks, uh, we have the following pieces. So we start by connecting to all the tools used in your modern data stack, things like the data warehouse, dashboarding tools, data catalogs, and even more things that may contain any knowledge related to data, things like Slack history for, for the data channels and things like that. We then automatically create uh, what we call the knowledge layer, which captures a lot of the knowledge stored in these tools. Uh, so things like table definitions, popular calculation, documentation, and many more. Once we have that knowledge layer, we created a, a retrieval module, which is essentially RAG module that allows us to get context on many different aspects of the data for a given input question. So for instance, let's say someone is asking about uh, conversion rates, uh, our retrieval module can get all the reports, um, tables and metrics that relate to conversion rates. Um, and the last piece is the AI multi-agent framework, which is highly customizable um, and can interact with many of the tools that this organization use. So the original dashboards that they had or like the data warehouse to run queries, et cetera. Cool. And so ultimately organizations can build uh, multi-agent systems that their end users can interact with. So just to give you an example flow, a user can come and ask for a specific dashboard. We'll use RAG on top of the knowledge player I was mentioning to get the best dashboard. If the dashboard doesn't exactly satisfy their need, then they can use the analytics agent to write and execute a SQL query in the original data warehouse. And if they're happy with the results, uh, they can create custom tool agents like Slack integrations or even like Gmail integrations to share back the results with, with their team. And this is just one example, simple flow. It's highly customizable based on the organization's needs. So just to implement this in practice, there's key three steps. The first really is to create this fundamental piece that we call the knowledge layer. And that's the layer that's used in RAG that stores all the business context that we need for the model's responses. So it stores things like tables, columns, metrics, dimensions, report, documentation about all these things. And that's really a key, key component of, of our platform. Uh, to create this, we built parsing models that connect to tools like Tableau, the data warehouse, and DBT, and automatically will uh, curate that knowledge piece into a clean format that serves as the foundation of these LLMs. The next step is to configure what we call the base agents, which are used for search and analytics to build a workflow. So depending on the capabilities that you would want to serve to your end users, you can start composing agents that will talk to each other. And so for instance, you could configure agents to search over Tableau reports and DBT documentation, and then add another descriptive analytics agents to write uh, Python or SQL queries. And the last piece is this custom tool agent based on the specific end user workflow that we're looking at. So for instance, we had a customer create a Zendesk agent that their customers can use to create tickets when they cannot still find the answer through, through chat. Uh, and we can also do things like send emails or create a slide deck from number station. So really here, anything that can be done for API calls is in scope here because that can be prompted in the model. Um, and ultimately, you can embed these agents in, in existing application, things like Slackbot uh, or use, we have also front end, uh, but usually people prefer to embed where the users already interact. Cool. And so just to recap the number station intro, we're really helping address uh, the key challenges that these data teams face, whether it's internally or even externally for analytics companies that serve dashboards to, to their customers by providing a unified and accessible and actionable approach to analytics. So unified in the sense that it's unifying knowledge across uh, different knowledge sources, um, accessible in the sense that more business users can now query SQL or write pandas code and actionable uh, because we're really trying to complete the end user workflow with this custom tool agents that I was referring to. Cool, so this wraps the intro. I wanna to jump to the fun part now, which is the uh, technical deep dive. And I'm gonna show you how to build a multi-agent system from the, from the beginning. So I'm gonna focus on one of our analytics agents, which essentially writes and runs uh, SQL queries to answer business questions. And let's say I wanted to build such a system from scratch. The obvious first thing to try is prompting an LLM with FewShot or ZeroShot Learning. So I'll create a prompt with an instruction. Uh, Hi, can you write some SQL for me to answer this question? We can put in the data schema just so the model has a bit more context on the database. And the model is gonna take this prompt, write a SQL query. I can then go copy this query into my SQL editor and get a response. 
And this is a good start, but there's obviously limitation with this approach because the LLM cannot execute the query. So this manual workflow of me copy pasting is not ideal. And so how can we do better? So an improvement to the previous workflow is just to add a SQL execution tool in our pipeline. So after the model generates SQL, we can automatically send that in an editor with an API and uh, and call the SQL API to get the result for the SQL execution. And so the naive way to implement this is really just writing code that implements this control flow. It's better than me going and manually copy pasting the result, but it's obviously still pretty limited because let's say for instance, we had a compilation error. The model used the wrong table name. Um, well, with this flow, there's really not much we can do and we're stuck in this case. We could start adding edge cases in the control flow of if you hit a compilation error, then go back to the first step, but it just quickly gets very complicated. And so how can we do better than this? Um, and that's where agents come in. So we talk about agentic systems where essentially the control flow of the operations we're running is not set by a human or a developer, but really by a machine. And we talk about LLM agents when the machine here is the LLM. So instead of running the query each time it's generated by the model, we can use uh, something called tool calling, where really the model intelligently decides when to call a tool and when to run the query. So here, for instance, this is just an illustrative example, but the sequence of step that the model would take is uh, non-deterministic. It will try to find the best path and course of actions to get to the final results. So first it writes some SQL, executes it, sees that there's this compilation error. So based on this message, it's gonna go and correct to get the right table name. Then it can actually execute and, and terminate this flow. Um, so that's much better. Uh, but let's say the user was expecting something in the order of a thousand or two thousand. How do we know that this is correct? And that's the key piece that's missing here is accuracy. We really want the predictions of the model to be grounded in something that belongs to the business. And right now the metric that it generated we, we have no clue if it's correct or not. The model just made the best guess based on the schema that it saw. So the key to this accuracy problem is RAG and Snorkel has done a lot of uh, work on that front, which essentially stands for retrieval augmented generation. Um, and essentially we need to use RAG because there's so much knowledge and organization that we can't fit all of it in the LLM prompt. So we're gonna store it and then retrieve it based on the question that the user is asking. Um, and so in the context of number sp station specifically, the source we're searching over is this knowledge layer that I was mentioning, which stores information extracted from the data warehouse, dashboard, or, or documentation. And so here, an example that I would have in my knowledge layer uh, could be a metric definition for uh, the number of customers. So it has the SQL expression and the table that this metric is calculated on. And if you see here, in the specific example, it has a filter to filter out uh, customers that uh, have their account closed. And that type of logic cannot be inferred by the model out of the box. That's why we really need to have this right component to, to make the model aware of the business rules. Okay, and so we can then just add RAG as another tool for our agents and it can call it when it thinks that it needs it. So for instance, here, um, the updated flow for our LLM agent would be to first retrieve the context get the definition for what we mean by number of customers, then generate the SQL, run it, and now we get actually the, the response that's aligned with the user's expectation. So in terms of just evaluating this approach compared to vanilla LLM prompting, we saw huge improvements uh, on real benchmarks from our customers up to 10 to 20 points in execution accuracy. Um, so this is really great and much better. But if we take a step back and, and recall some of the things I was mentioning earlier, we really want the agents to do more than just write SQL, right? Like users may want to find a dashboard and do many other things. So how can we do all these different things in, in one flow that gets really complicated with one agent? And so to do that, we can start implementing a, a multi-agent system. So if a user wants to find a report, understand the field in the table, write a query, we can bring all these functionalities through a multi-agent system. Um, and essentially all these agents will have a specific role in the workflow and they can talk to each other through a chat manager or really like a router agent that is responsible for saying, it's your turn to talk and solve the task. And what's really exciting is all these agents can share the same conversation history. 
So it makes it really easy to jump from one agent to another, but they can also collaborate to solve the task together. And so we can start building very powerful applications. Cool, so I'm getting next to the end of the deep dive. The last bit I wanted to cover is the connection between unstructured data and structured data, especially focusing on, on Snorkel. And so everything I've covered so far lives in the analytics world, which is mostly structured or semi-structured. But there's tons of knowledge also stored in unstructured sources like a document store. And we may want to query that as part of the analytics workflow. So how can we do that? Um, there's two options. Option one is when the schema of the unstructured data is well defined. So let's say we have uh, a bunch of quotes, uh, documents that are PDF documents, but really they have the same information every time, like customer name, policy ID, um, quote amount, etc. So in that case, we can use a document extraction flow from Snorkel to transform the data into a structured table in the database. And then we can start querying that table uh, with number stations. So for instance, here, if I want to know the average quote price for my healthcare company, um, that's the sort of question that really lives in the structured world. And once the document extraction is done, we can just run that query over a database. There are other more complex scenarios when the schema is not really so clear. So for instance, let's say there are specific clauses mentioned in my quote that are not always present. Not all customers have them. It's like in unstructured text. And so if I was trying to extract that into a structured format, I'll very easily lose a lot of information. So I actually want to keep that unstructured content, but I want to also be able to reason over it uh, during my analytics workflow. So the way to combine this type of two sources is through a multi-agent framework where we can have a text to SQL agent interacting with a database as uh, Shane was mentioning and a document agent that is gonna be interacting with the unstructured data uh, and document store through RAG. So just an example workflow here, let's say someone is asking about a specific customer and if any of their contracts mentions flood coverage. Well, the first thing I could do is ask the text to SQL agent to give me the contract IDs for that customer that's very structured and lives in a database. And once we have those contract IDs, we can go over the document store and look for the clause that's mentioning flood damage, which is very unstructured and hard to store in the structured data. So that's pretty much it for the deep dive. I'm gonna show you a quick demo uh, of these agents in action, in particular, uh, a small streamlit app that we built uh, for demo purposes um, on top of our agents. Um, and really you can think of it as uh, the APIs that power this app. In general, customers like to store, um, like to use the, the, the front end that they have already, like embedding the app in, um, in Slack or something like that. So I'm gonna show uh, an ad performance example. And in this demo, we have a multi-agent system uh, with two agents talking to each other. Uh, and in particular, I'm focusing on analytics agents. One is responsible for descriptive analytics. So really answering uh, what type of questions, like what was this metric over that quarter and things like that. And the other is more a diagnostic agent for like drilling down into specific patterns. So, I can start by saying monthly conversions in 2023. Uh, so this will route my descriptive assistant because this question is, um, is pretty precise. Like I know what I'm looking for and it's gonna give me the performance of all my ads uh, for 2023. Uh, and let's say I actually wanna visualize it so I can say plot it. Um, and this is gonna go and update the code to give me a chart. One thing to note here is this is Python code and uh, working over CSV. Um, in enterprise use cases, usually we use SQL and uh, actually run the queries on the database, but just for demo purposes here, uh, CSV is fine. So it gave me a chart, uh, which is good and it has a downward trend. So let's say for instance, I wanted to have a, a bar chart. I can ask it to update that. Um, and I can also do things like change the color, the font, et cetera, but I'm not gonna get into those details, but it's really interactive and, and users can customize. So now I have my bar chart with this downward trend and I'm still in the descriptive analytics world, like analyzing specific KPIs, but now I actually wanna understand why is this going down? And so I can ask it, explain the downward trend 
And so I would expect this to be routed to my diagnostic agent, which is responsible for like those drill downs and trying to understand uh, what's happening in the data. So the diagnostic agent is going to look at diagnostic analysis and it's going to start looking at the company type. So this financial company we're looking at is putting ad uh, across different channels and, and different companies. And so it's starting to look at the company type. It tells me, okay, by company type, we see that there is a, a clear decline for companies, events online, the, the thing is really steady. And so um, we see that there's a downward trend from January to December. Uh, the models we use in the backend are multimodal, so they can actually read the chart and summarize it, which is uh, really cool. Uh, and so then it's going to do another level of drill down. And what's exciting is I didn't tell it to do this other level. It's just by itself said, okay, I'm, I'm onto something here. Let me look further. So to further diagnose, we can drill down into the company subcategory. Um, and so it's going to look at the subcategory. And now we see that Silicon Valley Bank has a very significant drop uh, for, for the drill down, uh, which actually makes sense. The company had a, a big financial crisis last year. Uh, and so it summarizes all of the, all of this information, very high number of conversions from January and February, and then a sharp decline, uh, which remains. So it thinks that this is what explained the drop. Uh, would you like to investigate further? No, thanks. Um, and again, for demo purposes, we're putting the agent names here so that you can get a sense of what happens in the background. Uh, so here it's routing back to my general assistant, which is there really for like the management of the chat and, and routing between agents. So as we kind of begin to wrap up here, and then thankfully we do have some time for Q and A. Um, I know we you know, we didn't have a chance to dive extremely deep uh, into some of these topics, but uh, we do have a number of Gen AI webinars that are available on demand. So if you want to learn a little bit more about what goes into RAB optimization or how you fine tune an LLM, um, that's available for you. Uh, we also have live weekly demos. Um, so every week we demo. Um, a different part of Starkle Flow for a different use case. And then, of course, you can always provide, request a, a private introduction and demo as well. Um, and there are some links for both Snorkel and Number Station um, to follow up and, and learn a little bit more. So with that, let's jump in, Jane. I think we had a couple of questions uh, come in uh, during your section, so I'll start there. Um, the first one is, I might have a silly question regarding programmatic labeling functions. If we get the logic from SMEs on how to label data, can we not use the same logic to solve our problems? Not exactly. Uh, when it comes to you know, large language models uh, or even smaller specialized uh, models, they have to be trained on data in a specific fashion. Uh, so if you remember those a little bit earlier in the deck, there was a slide and I kind of talked about labeled uh, prompt response pairs, for example. Uh, so at the end of the day, you have to have a set of you know high quality you know, prompts and responses, or it might be easier to say questions and answers. Um, those are necessary to train the model. It will learn from those examples uh, and also kind of generalize as well. So you don't necessarily have to provide it a million examples, uh, but provide it enough examples that it can be both accurate and still generalize um, to examples it might have not have seen before. And you need the SIB um, logic to essentially figure out which of those pairs are good or bad, right? So if you have a, a large um, data set, it could be created from different sources, right? It could be from call logs. It could even be uh, a chatbot that's running, right? And, and you're capturing those interactions. Uh, but you know, given you know hundreds or thousands of those, uh, we need to understand from the SAVs how they're deciding which ones are good or bad. Then we can filter out the good ones and use those to train the models. Um, so it's definitely key to get the SMB logic, but the path to your AI goes through tuning those models underneath. I think this one would be for, you know, is, uh, is making the knowledge layer manual. Seems like it could be a lot of work or time. Yeah, that's a great question. So the initial version of the knowledge layer is fully automated. It's basically a lot of parsing from SQL and from these tools, as well as using LLMs to clean the data and, and summarize it. There is an admin role in Number Station where people can inspect the knowledge layer and confirm, oh, this metric was parsed incorrectly, or I want to change that. Usually the amount of work uh, that we require from admins correlates with how uh, clean the data model underneath is. So for organizations that have a good semantic layer and a good data model, 
there's not a lot of manual work. If the semantic layer is a bit all over the place, then uh, admins have to step in and, and do some cleanup there. So it really depends. Great. And this question, I think, was from one of your earlier slides. I didn't note down uh, the exact slides. Hopefully, you'll recall. Uh, how does decision three know that the table name is US customer? So I think this was the slide where the model uses the wrong table in the SQL, uh, and there's a compilation error. Um, so the chat between all the steps of the agents is shared. So if there's a tool call that generates a compilation error, the error message will say, I cannot find this table. And so that gets routed back to the LLM agent, which is going to look back at the schema and say, oh, I misspelled or used the wrong table and then fix it. Great. Thank you. Um, and thanks for joining us today, Joy D. Uh, this one is, can be to Shane or Inez, if you want to chime in. Uh, can the router integrate uh, info from multiple VDBs to generate a holistic response? The short answer is yes, uh, even though most examples, uh, most webinars like this are going to talk about a pipeline with a single vector database. Uh, in practice, yes, you know there are implementations out there where there are multiple vector databases. This one moves on to the agentic framework. So from an ag agentic framework, it seems like seems that having a planner agent that coordinates the relevance routing sequence to your agents, how much actual control should a user have over this planner agent? Ideally, you'd want it automated, but do you fine tune it before production? There's two ways to think about it. We can go full automation, but that's obviously a bit risky. Like maybe we don't want all agents to talk to each other. Uh, what we find works best in practice is a hybrid. So. For instance, certain agents can only speak to other agents, uh, and some agents uh, can talk to other agents with the with an AI approach. So we can really customize the routing function to be a mix of LLM and and rules uh, depending on the control flow. So one example would be: I never want to run an action unless it's verified by a human. We can always make uh, the action agent talk to the user right before it writes the action just for confirmation. So there's all these sorts of guardrails in the conversation that we have to create, especially in real workflows, to make sure nothing goes wrong in, in application. And that's usually all customizable uh, by the customer. So for knowledge, databases and organizations often contain multimodal unstructured data, such as videos, webinars, audio, podcasts, et cetera, PDFs. Uh, can this assortment of unstructured data be parsed and queried in your agentic RAG to generate accurate responses? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Currently, we do not use multimodal. The, the models are multimodal in the sense that once I generate a chart, it can read it. Uh, but our knowledge layer is mostly text, uh, SQL expressions. Uh, we could add charts uh, as a future direction. We haven't yet. That's a good uh, suggestion. Well, I think you made a great point at the end of your presentation there uh, that you know, with tools such as historical flow, you could certainly do some pre-processing of the different types of documents, right? Whether you have PDFs or presentations, uh, you can pre-process those with predictive information extraction models that'll find that structured data you're looking for and then put that in the database. So that's certainly one path. Exactly. I guess to give an example of something we do right now is if we have a Tableau report, we take a screenshot of the report and we use an LLM to summarize that. So it kind of captures the visual charts, uh, but we don't actually store the charts in, in our database. This one is for Inez. Uh, how does it respond if you ask it an invalid question? That's a great question that um, happened a lot. Like end users don't know the types of questions that they can or cannot ask. So we have a few more agents that we can add uh, depending on the control. One is clarification. So if the question is vague, asking them, what exactly do you mean? Do you mean this metric or this other metric? And show them what we have in the knowledge layer so they can be a bit more precise. And another is like more a guardrail agent that just says, I don't have the data to answer this question. So um, I cannot help you. Please contact me for support and things like that. Uh, we really try to guardrail the prediction because we're now dealing with non-technical users. And so we don't want to show them something that's wrong. And then they go and like use that in a deck or anything like that. So that's that's a very good question and, and something we've thought a lot about. And this one is about the router. Is the router an LLM or custom LLM? Any best practices for fine tuning uh, the router? Yes, yeah, so that's going back to like how the agents talk to each other. In the end, for us, it's a mix of rules of certain agents have to talk to other agents. Uh, before they take actions and LLMs for things that are a bit safer. Uh, we can also do things like the maximum number of back and forth between agents so we don't like enter infinite loops and things like that. So it's a hybrid. 
This one is about the number or the types of agents you've developed so far. So what agents uh, do you have you developed so far? Are the agents generic and can users use them out of the box or do they have to be tuned to specific domain requirements? The LLMs we use in the background are not necessarily ours. So we can use third-party LLMs or we've had customers use their own uh, private LLMs. Um, but the tuning of the LLMs, the knowledge that we put in the context, um, as well as the tool integrations with the data warehouse are all custom. Uh, we don't do LLM fine tuning at the moment uh, for this specific agent, if that was the question. This one is on the uh, question about the flow of the diagnostic agent. So what is the flow for the diagnostic agent? Is this a chain of reasoning workflow? So that a specific agent is instructed to do drill downs. So we would only route to it when we're trying to drill down to specific cause. And that's an example where the maximum number of drill down is set to something. So we don't enter infinite path, but essentially it's going to try a bunch of different things. And when it's onto some strand, it's going to drill down even more. The Snorkel have pre-built agents that can be leveraged and revised, uh, such as diagnostic agents around code development. Yeah, so I think the short answer is Snorkel flow um, certainly doesn't provide you agents out of the box, uh, but it's a platform which helps you train the models that are used by those agents. Um, so if you think about uh, some of those slides I did with the um, agentic rag patterns, uh, if you have a router, which we kind of had a few questions here on, uh, that router typically means that you have uh, one or more you know, specialized um, agents or pipelines in the background. Um, so we see this in practice. We have a customer who is building um, an assistant or chatbot, and what they need to understand is when someone asks something, uh, what's their intent, right? What what is how do they classify this question? Are they asking uh, about billing? Are they asking about transaction status? Are they, you know, filing a complaint? Uh, so our platform helps you curate the data to train the model that, for example, can help you classify that user's question. Um, and we actually use that same approach when we do multi-LLM routing. Uh, we actually have a predictive model within Snorkel Flow, uh, which is derived from your training data, right, to help it classify uh, the types of prompts or questions. And then we can use that classification to route it to the correct LLM. Um, so the short answer is our platform helps you curate the training data and then fine tune those underlying models, which you then might wrap in agents or consume from agents but you have to build those agents or, or use a platform like Number Station. Are all the agents uh, based on LLMs? So, I mean, outside of Number Station, agents uh, have existed for a long time. It's not necessarily LLMs. Uh, within Number Station, they're not all LLMs. So just for instance, the user that's chatting is an agent in our control flow. It's just that anytime we want input from that agent, we go to the user uh, and we can have more deterministic agents to set up some rules in the workflow if we wanted to. Uh, so yeah, short answer is no. So I guess another question after your comment on having rules that define agent interactions, what are some of the approaches that can be taken to optimize the rules? It seems that the initial design probably needs to be well thought out, followed by robust testing verification. But I was wondering if there are some ground rules, such as tool agents always ask user first. So we have a set of best practices that we always impose when we create these agents workflows. Ultimately, the rules depend on how many agents we put in the workflow. And some users only want analytics agents. Other users only want search agents. So the rules depend, uh, but we do have best practices. For instance, the example I was giving earlier, like any operation that's a bit risky and we want user validation before, we always have user confirm those operations in, in the configuration of the of the chat. Can we quickly swap in LLMs in the framework from GPT-4.0 uh, to Claude or Llama? Agnostic framework would be best so we can switch if needed based on enterprise relationships, closed versus open source. Yeah, absolutely. We uh, are agnostic to LLMs. We have customers use their own internal LLMs that they've developed. So it's really just a configuration of, uh, of the platform. Uh, ultimately, like we prefer even if the LLMs are hosted by the customers, they own them, they can tune them over time. Um, especially for like domain specific data and things like that. How could, can we use this in a data mesh world, agents from every data product supporting a workflow? Ultimately for a number station, it's really about analytics workflows. So really interacting with tools in the modern data stack, 
the question is asking about expanding, like that definitely could be the, the future vision. Uh, for now, we found that there's a lot of work just in the analytics world. So that's where we're spending our time. Great. Well, I think we've gotten through most of the questions. I see we're coming up here uh, on the hour. So uh, thanks everyone for staying on for the Q&A. Hopefully uh, you found this uh, webinar to be insightful. Of course, there's a lot more to Snorkel and Numbers Station. Uh, so I encourage you uh, to reach out to the team uh, either at snorkel.ai or uh, numbersstation.ai uh, and get a demo and learn a little bit more about how both products can be used uh, within your organizations. And as Shane mentioned, we have lots of uh, webinars here at Snorkel. We run a weekly demo. We also have uh, topical webinars every other week. Uh, and you can always find those at snorkel.ai slash events. So with that, uh, Ines and Shane, I'll let you say uh, a few last words to the audience and then we'll end today's event. Yeah, well, first, just thank you everyone for joining us. And Ines, thank you for joining us. It was great seeing what you're doing. Uh, but yeah, you know, the closing thoughts from you know my side is really, you know, AI is only as good as the data you're providing it. Right, so the higher quality um, training data that you're able to curate uh, and deliver, the higher the accuracy and the quality of the responses coming from AI, whether it's assistants or chatbots or co-pilots or other tools. Yeah, and I guess just to sum up, thank you for having me as well. Uh, it was very exciting. I don't think I got to answer all the questions and I didn't share my contact info. So if anyone wants to follow up by email, uh, my email is firstname.lastname at numberstation.ai. And I'll be happy to continue the discussion, uh, but thanks again. Great. Well, thanks everyone. I'm going to end today's event. We'll look forward to seeing you again in the future.